Uh, can you please draw a diagram to illustrate the cardiac ventricular myocyte action potential? Okay, yeah. So, drawing the ventricular myocyte action potential on the x axis, you'll have time in milliseconds. On the y axis, you have the membrane potential, which is measured in millivolts. The cardiac ventricular myocyte action potential has five phases and looks a bit like this, kind of a wave form. So it has five phases, there's phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. So phase four is resting membrane potential. So that is at negative 90 millivolts, and that is maintained by the KIR channel. So there's a sort of a slow potassium leak. Threshold potential is at negative 65 millivolts. And the depolarization of a neighboring myocyte causes an increase in the membrane potential up to that threshold potential. At that threshold potential, you get fast voltage-gated sodium channels that open and cause rapid depolarization of the cell membrane. Okay. So that's phase zero, rapid depolarization. So fast sodium channels and sodium is flooding into the cell. This goes up to a positive deflection of positive 20, I have a common, positive 20 millivolts is the maximum it gets to. When it reaches positive 20 millivolts, the fast sodium channels close and some fast potassium channels open. And so potassium floods out of the cell. And so the cell membrane starts to become more negative. Here. This is phase one early repolarization. Okay. This is only short lived as the fast potassium channels close. And you also get opening of L type calcium channels here. Okay, so this is unique to the cardiac myocyte action potential. It's the plateau phase, phase two. So that is maintained by L-type calcium channels causing influx of calcium. At the same time, you also get slow potassium channels that open and cause some outward movement of potassium ions. So you have positive ions moving both in and out of the cell, which is why it plateaus. So you have a net of electrical neutrality, stability. Over the course of phase two, the calcium channels close, but the potassium channels remain open. And as they close, you start to get repolarization phase three until you reach your baseline, again, and your resting membrane potential at negative 90 millivolts. So to summarize, you've got sodium, fast sodium in, in phase zero, potassium in, in phase one, calcium in phase two, potassium in phase three, and then your resting membrane potential is phase four. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I agree with what you've said. Well, now we move on to the next question. So now can you draw me a pacemaker cell action potential and how do the two compare? So again, you'll have time in milliseconds on the x-axis and on the y-axis you'll have membrane potential in millivolts. Okay, so the pacemaker cell action potential has a different waveform and it has three phases. It looks a bit like that. Okay, so you have phase zero, which is depolarization, you have phase three, which is repolarization, you have phase four, which is the kind of the baseline membrane potential. So the lowest it gets to is around about negative 60 millivolts. And your um, threshold potential is approximately negative 40 millivolts. What you can see here is that the baseline membrane potential, the resting membrane potential is unstable, going slow decay. So it gets more positive over time. And this is caused by uh, something called the HCL channel, which means that potassium leaks out of the cell and sodium leaks into the cell. So you have inward movement and outward movement of positive ions. However, it is slightly more selective for sodium ions, so you get more inward movement of positive ions to the cell than you get outward movement of positive ions out of the cell. So slowly the cell membrane becomes more positive. This is aided at negative 50 millivolts by the opening of T-type calcium channels, transient-type calcium channels, which assist that inward movement of positive ions and therefore more positive deflection of the cell membrane potential. Until you reach negative 40 millivolts, which as we've already said, is the threshold potential. When you reach the threshold potential, L-type calcium channels open, not sodium channels, so that's the other key difference here, and that causes depolarization, so that's calcium we need. But the positive deflection point, the maximum point, again, it's positive 20 millivolts. Your calcium channels close, your potassium channels open, you get outward movement of positive ions from the cell, and you get repolarization of the cell membrane because all the positive ions leave. 
and that takes back the baseline and the process remains. Okay. What about the difference in time? So the times are fairly similar. They're both approximately so the ventricular myocyte action potential is around about 250 milliseconds. The pacemaker cell action potential is variable depending on the rate of decay of your um, baseline potential, which is altered by things like your muscarinic and adrenal receptors. That was one sheet, I'm just too late. <laughs> um, so now, next question. Can you please classify for us the antiarrhythmic agents and can you give examples in each category? How do they affect the action potential? So, Antiarrhythmic medications are traditionally classified, as you guys will all know, by the Vaughan Williams classification. So this kind of breaks them down into four classes. There's class one, two, three, and four, and it's based on what receptors or what channels they act on. So class one antiarrhythmic agents are sodium channel blockers. So they will impact this bit here. So they'll impact phase zero of the cardiac action potential, okay? and they'll prolong phase zero. Phase one anterior, sorry, class one anterior agents are also further subdivided into class one A, B, and C, depending on their secondary effects, which are on the refractory period of cardiac muscle. So phase one A, so class one A prolong the refractory period. An example of that would be procainamide. Class one B antiarrhythmics shorten the refractory period of cardiac muscle, an example being lidocaine. And class one C antiarrhythmics have no effect on the um, refractory period, an example being flaconide. So class two antiarrhythmics are beta blockers, which are all make sense beta blockers, so bisoprolol, metoprolol, esmolol. Class three antiarrhythmics are potassium channel blockers, an example being amiodarone, and they will, um, they prolong the repolarization phase of that potential. I'm sorry, I didn't mention with beta blockers what they do. We did mention it briefly before. So they will prolong the slow decay of um, phase four of your pacemaker cell so action potential. And then class four and here is a calcium channel blockers and they prolong this, the plateau phase. Okay. An example being bra. Good. Um, are there any limitations to this classification? Are there any alternative ways to classify antiarrhythmics that you know of? So the Vaughan Williams classification does have limitations. First of all, there are drugs that don't fit nicely into any of the categories listed above, such as digoxin, which doesn't yeah. fit into any of the classes, or magnesium. The other limitation with the Vormalin classification is that some drugs that do fit within it fit into multiple categories simultaneously. Amiodarone, for example, is a class three antiarrhythmic agent, but has class one, two, and four properties. And Esmolol also acts in multiple different ways. Okay. So the alternative classification you can use is based on clinical indication and use. So you can classify antiarrhythmic agents into drugs that are treat, used as treatment for supraventricular arrhythmias, such as digoxin and beta blockers. Drugs that are used as treatments for ventricular arrhythmias, so that, for example, would be lidocaine. Drugs that are used in treatment of both, such as amiodarone, and drugs that are used for digoxin overdose, such as phenotype. Okay. Good. Uh, so, speaking of digoxin, can you tell me about it? So, digoxin is a glycoside, which is extracted from the leaves of Digitalis lanata, the foxglove plant, and it is used in the treatment of atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, as a rate control medication. It is available as tablets or as a solution for intravenous injection. The intramuscular injection is associated with pain and tissue necrosis and sometimes used. It is used in a dose of a loading dose initially of between one and one and a half milligrams in divided doses over the period of 24 hours, followed by a maintenance dose of between 125 and 250 micrograms, with therapeutic levels of roughly one to two micrograms per litre. Regarding its pharmacokinetics, it is variably absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract with an oral bioavailability of roughly 70%. It is 25% protein bound has a large volume of distribution of between five and 10 liters per kilogram. It is minimally metabolized and is instead excreted unchanged by the kidneys. It is freely filtered glomerulus and undergoes active tubular secretion. It has a half-life, an elimination half-life of approximately 35 hours, which is significantly prolonged in the frame. 
regarding this pharmacodynamics, its mechanism of action is twofold. It has both direct and indirect actions on the heart. So its direct actions are that it blocks the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This has the effect of increasing intracellular levels of sodium, which then means that more sodium is exchanged for calcium at the sodium calcium exchange pump. This increases intracellular levels of calcium indirectly, which is responsible for its positive ionotropic effect. Its indirect actions are that it enhances the release of acetylcholine at muscarinic, uh, cardiac muscarinic receptors. And this is responsible for its AV nodal blocking and um, reduced automaticity actions. Its side effects can be classified by system. It has minimal effects on the respiratory system. Cardiovascular effects we've discussed in part, so it will cause AV nodal conduction delay and will cause reduced automaticity of the positive ionotropy. It also produces characteristic ECG changes that are not signs of toxicity, including a prolonged PR interval, shortened QTC, characteristic ST segment depression, and T wave flattening. It causes alteration in colour vision and it can cause headaches. It is also associated with gynecomastia, with gastrointestinal upset, including anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And it can also cause a rash. In overdose, in excess levels, it is quite a toxic medication. Levels above 2.5 micrograms per litre. Remember, we said one to two is normal range for therapeutic norms. So two and a half micrograms and above can be toxic, but normally you start to see toxicity above 10 micrograms per litre. Toxin is a very toxic medication, and so this is a medical emergency and should be treated as such by seeking senior health or appropriate, recognizing and declaring an emergency and dotting the need to be approached to management. Specific features of overdose are primarily cardiac. It can produce a variety of ECG arrhythmias, including all forms of heart block and including ventricular tachycardias. And it can also produce hyperkalemia, which should be treated and managed as appropriate. Hypokalemia, conversely, may worsen toxicity and should also be corrected. If levels are above 20 micrograms per litre or life-threatening arrhythmia is present, then Digifab is indicated. And digox Digifab is a digoxin-specific IgG fragment that has greater affinity for digoxin than its receptor, binds it and removes it from the circulation through the kidneys. Key interactions of digoxin. Amyoidoron will increase levels of digoxin and phenytoin will reduce levels of digoxin, which is the basis for using phenytoin as the antiarrhythmic of choice in digoxin toxicity. Okay, um, before we do the last one, this is a sort of an if time thing. We're going out at 1.15. You guys were happy with five minutes extra? Yeah. Talk about amiodarone? Yeah. yeah. Hey, so tell me about amiodarone. So amiodarone is a benzofuran derivative. It's used in the treatment of both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, as well as called Parkinson White syndrome. <coughs> It is available as tablets and a solution for injection. And the solution for injection should be made up with 5% dextrose prior to administration. It is used in the treatment of the conditions mentioned above. Initially in a loading dose of five milligrams per kilogram over one hour, followed by an infusion over 24 hours of 15 milligrams per kilogram. Regarding its pharmacokinetics, it is poorly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract with an oral bioavailability of between 50 and 70 percent. It is highly protein bound and competes for plasma protein binding sites with other drugs that are highly protein bound, such as phenytoin and warfarin. Its protein binding is greater than 95 percent. It has a very large volume of distribution between 2 and 70 liters per kilogram. It is metabolized in the liver to desmethylamiodarone, which is an active metabolite, and it is excreted through the bile through the skin and through the tears with a very long half-life of between 20 and 100 days. Its mechanism of action we've already touched on it is a class three antiarrhythmic, so it is a potassium channel blocker and prolongs the repolarization phase, but it also exhibits class one, two and four antiarrhythmic effects. Amiodarone has a large number of different side effects which are best approached systematically. With the respiratory system, amiodarone is associated with severe life-threatening respiratory complications and chronic use. 
including pulmonary fibrosis and pneumonitis. There is a rate of about 10% at 10 years treatment and 10% of those are fatal. Cardiovascular is not particularly arrhythmogenic, but rapid dose infusions of large doses of amiodarone can cause hypotension and bradycardia, and so cardiac monitoring is important. It can cause corneal microdeposits. It causes photosensitivity, a slate gray appearance characteristically. It can cause significant hepatic impairment, including jaundice and cirrhosis. And it also causes gastrointestinal upset. Finally, amiodarone causes significant thyroid impairment, most commonly hypothyroidism, but hyperthyroidism is also, also a feature. It prevents the peripheral conversion of T3 to T4. Amiodarone interacts with a number of different medications. It prolongs the QT interval, and so shouldn't be given with other drugs that prolong the QT interval, such as tricyclic antidepressants. It increases digoxin levels, as already discussed, so it shouldn't be used in treatment of arrhythmias caused by digoxin toxicity. And as already discussed, it competes with warfarin and fenitol in the plasma brine protein binding sites. So levels of those drugs should be monitored and doses reduced. Okay, great. Cool. You guys will be well aware already of the idea of having a structure for medication presentation stuff, I presume, when talking about it. Yeah, we no. haven't like practiced it. Right. So that's kind of that's the one that um Peck and Hill breaks down into is sort of so when you're asked to talk about the drug, particularly in a biodependent setting or biopsorbent, if you can have a structure that you know and you can fall back on, then you can sort of start to scoop up whatever this knowledge you have that fits into those different categories. So start off with just like a definition of the drug, what it is. So class, key indications, and if you if it's something like propofol, knowing the molecular structure is often required. So things like succinylcholine are highly expected to help. Indications uses doses. So, and presentation, so how it appears. So, for things like profile, it's presented as a lipid emulsion when you'll need to know the And for gases, you might need to know manufacture and storage and that as well. So, then you kind of get all the physiochemical properties of the drug out way. You start to talk about the pharmacokinetic properties and the pharmacodynamic properties. So, pharmacokinetic, you break them into absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, which I think we did with those. And then, pharmacodynamic properties, you break down. First of all, mechanism of action, and then effects by system, I think, is the third. And then you go to the other stuff. So any special features of the drug, so things like paracetamol overdose or the drug so you'd be expected to know quite well in detail. And then interactions, key sort of positional features and those. So that's be stuff like for thiopental intra-arterial injections or whatnot, we're not kind of there because that's just a classic anesthetic exam at this point. So I partly wanted to practice my own a bit, but for everyone's benefit doing the structure of the drugs as well, because that kind of gives a clear idea. Absolutely. And the digoxin thing, is that a protein binding effect or is it an enzyme induction? So digoxin is not particularly protein bind, bound. Um, amiodarone is an enzyme inducer, so you would think it should decrease levels of digoxin. Digoxin isn't metabolized hepatically anyway, so it shouldn't. I don't think it's either. I don't know how it increases levels. Um, and also, for the ventricular action potential, I thought T-type Calcium channels were involved. Uh, but, uh, they may be somewhere online, but I don't think they were key I in my reading that. yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I've written L type. For the plateau phase, I've written L type. I thought for the for phase zero, there might be a, um, a T type element. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you'd get the points for what you said. I should write T type. <laughs> We'll do a little bit of questions as well in a sec, so I'll just get those ready. But yeah, definitely look that up, because if I've got it wrong, I don't want to be telling you guys porkies. Uh, do you know the um, type 1 anti -hero? Yes. Um, so they're the membra membrane stabilizers. Yeah, so do the Yeah, so do the um, Yeah, no, I'm trying to share. <laughs> okay. So you're saying they affect your refractory period. Yeah. Is that the absolute refractory period? The rest of it. Okay. Yeah, because you can't affect the absolute okay. refractory period. And the sodium channel blockers will, so that they'll, that phase zero won't be a nice, won't be straight It'll be slanted, be prolonged. slanted, and the effect of that is that the whole thing takes a bit longer, is it? And then so you... Yeah, and then the they've also got the secondary effects on the refractory period as well. Yes, exactly. Fine. Okay. 
Great. Um, and obviously, because I haven't been through these sessions before, so obviously, without much prompting from Duncan, you pull out all. Yeah. In 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 a, in a real life situation, would you be asked? Oh God, I wouldn't be nearly so eloquent. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will, be. you will. But you know, like, would you automatically go on to digital toxicity? Do you think, or do you think it would be something you would be? So, if you know it, volunteer it. Yeah. Um, right. If you know it and it's relevant, volunteer it. Yeah. So the, the, the phrase I've heard a few times is empty your bucket, which is just say what you do know, because you yeah. can't expect them to prompt you for all the things you happen to know. If you know it, say it, offer it. Okay, and if yeah. it's not what they're looking for, it's their job to redirect you. Yeah, fine. And that's the key thing is that the examiners are there to guide you. And if they're saying nothing and you're saying lots, that's a good sign. And but what about, sorry, sorry. I was going to say, I'm, I haven't attempted it, I haven't done it, but my impression is that uh, do that definitely if you're sure of what you're saying. The temptation is obviously to bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. And like, or get you know, wrong. You'll get yourself yeah. in trouble if you... Do they... Have a, a, so say, say you speak at length about everything you know and it's all correct for mm -hmm. however, however many minutes, but they presumably have a mark sheet of things that they need to get you They'll to move you say. On. They'll move you right fine. They'll move you on when you need to. Okay. It's their job to lead you and it's just your job to say what you do know. They'll guide you through it. Right, uh, so what we do at this bit is just, if you either go to that website and enter the number or scan the QR code, we've got some example MCQs and obviously everyone at home, yeah. please do join in if you can. Um, and we'll go and run through those and hopefully they'll raise some points to discuss. <laughs> Where's that taking you? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Grand. Cool. So, guys at home, if you want to join in, please do. That'd be great. Um, and then we'll just take a couple of minutes and vote on what you think, and then we'll discuss them. So this is tick for true. This is tick for true. There's multiple true falses. Tick for true. Tick for true. Tick for true. You vote them. Cool. Give another mm -hmm. couple of seconds, then we'll go. Right. I will lock and what look. Great. So I think all these are true, which is just brilliant. Sorry. Um, so l type calcium channels, we've looked that up twice now. So yeah. we're, pretty, we're pretty confident about that one. Um, Vaughan, so yeah, so guys, Vaughan Williams classification, I, the, the way I've remembered it ever since I did a course was um, Nora Batty kills cats, class one, two, three, four, sodium channel, beta block. Potassium block, calcium block, noradicular cats. And that's stuck with me. And that's the easiest way to remember it for me. And if you do know what does what in the action potential, you can kind of work out roughly what they're probably going to do if you block them. Great. No, but you wouldn't do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, bye. Um, ventricular myocytes have a more negative recipe. So this one is true. Have you guys seen this before? This is like a common topic so ventricular myocytes have a more negative resting membrane than neutral myocytes. I did not 
yeah that does that come up in a few of my practice questions back in, when i was doing the mcq and it's the sort of thing they like to ask is that the ventricular resting on room temperature is minus 90 and the atrial is minus 70 and the pacemaker is minus 60 but unstable stuff like that is just yeah it's just one of those patterns so yeah and obviously neuronal resting on room temperature is minus 70 as well so just making you ask that as well pacemaker potential exhibits to decay due to t-type calcium channels yep in part so it's one of the two contributors yeah exactly so from negative 50 the t-type calcium channels contribute like negative 60 it's the hl channels with the sodium and potassium so by decay is that question that refers to the slope exactly yeah, yeah. so it is a very ne it is a negative potential that is becoming less negative with time i negative decay and then the resting membrane potential is maintained by potassium efflux. It is through KIR channels, which I think I briefly mentioned at the very beginning, if that is true. Is that influx? It'll be efflux. So potassium is very, very concentrated inside the cells, isn't it? So your oh, yeah. intracellular yes. potassium concentration is much greater than your extracellular potassium concentration. So yeah, you have, it goes down uh, Exactly, it goes down into rectal But KIR. It stands for inward rectifying. I don't understand that. The what? The inward rectifying. It stands for inwardly rectifying. Oh. Well, that's stupid. Let's not. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> to me, I could understand it if I thought about the the the, the fact that potassium is, there's lots of it in the cell and there's not much outside. And it's just again, that's another thing they ask a lot about is when you've got is what things are predominantly intracellular and what things are predominantly extracellular. And then when you know that, actually, it starts to make sense that calcium will bump the membrane potential up because it'll go into the cell, and it's positive. Whereas potassium will bring it down because it'll go out of the cell, and that starts to make sense. <laughs> Efflux of potassium would tend to depolarize. No, it would tend to hyperpolarize. Tend to hy there is also some sodium, I think, activity along the way. Yeah. It is written in Peck and Hill. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to argue yeah. with doctors Peck and Hill, <laughs> please do. Feel free, if you, genuinely, if you do come across anything that contradicts anything I say, please do just tell me not in the round because I do want to know if we've got stuff wrong for obvious reasons. Cool. Should we do the next one? Yeah. And do some amyotide. Yeah. 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 Grand. Okay. Uh, I suspect. You're all right, please. Good. Everyone got the two that are true, right? Which is good. So it is associated with fatal pulmonary complications. Uh, it is highly broken down, greater than 95 percent. Hence, its interaction with warfarin. That's just classic exam pattern recognition stuff. Is which drugs are highly broken down, and they'll often give you two, and go X is more operating down than Y and stuff like that it'll always be ones that are extremes and that'll be like 65 to 55. <laughs> it'll always be something like profile to something like ketamine which i remember is 98 to 25 i think uh has a small volume distribution so the volume distribution we said was between two and 70 liters per kilogram and that's pretty special 70 is massive obviously so highly um lipid soluble drug like fentanyl's volume distribution of four liters per kilogram so oh, that's pretty good. Good. I'm, I'm confused about which ones I've got wrong and right. Okay. Just based You've... on. So I know I got the first two right, everyone knew. And then. Right. If you've ticked any of the others, then they're wrong. So you ticked, I ticked, yes, yeah, so I ticked, I have a small one distribution, they obviously don't. Agree on them. And they're the ones I didn't know. So you got those right. So I've got them right. You've got them right. So that means four. Correct. If you said, so I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm not marking answers, yeah. I'm saying which ones are true. With the green, yeah, 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 so. yeah, 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 yeah. So that would be four, yeah, yeah. So that would be four out of five. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Do you mind? 
Uh, amiodarone shouldn't be used as a treatment for dropped overdose. Um, either way around. No, neither way around. It just shouldn't be used combined with two. Uh, what is used as a treatment for dropped and overdose? Okay. Uh, there's also a cousin of lidocaine you can use that Nexilitine, I think, is from memory. Uh, and it's more likely to call, this is just classic FRCA crap. It's more like hypo than hyper. I'm sorry. It's just, mm -hmm. I had that question quite a lot in practice. Yesterday, this thing, the course we did yesterday, the, the chap who was the who was going to do some of the questions for us, suggested that if something's protein bound, then it has a low volume distribution. But it's I was high volume distribution. But yeah, but he's, he's saying low, and the, the and stuff that's lipid soluble obviously has a higher. Volume I don't think that. I I was about to say the same thing. Is a very good predictor of volume of distribution. Because I can already think off the top of my head of two or three examples of drugs that are highly protein bound, such as propofol and such as amiodarone, that are highly protein bound and have a large volume distribution. Yeah, so don't think too much about it. I, also, I wouldn't yeah. rely on that as a rule of thumb. Right. That's the only suggestion I have. And uh, he's more like hyper, so more like hypo than hyper. Uh, the other thing they like asking about in amiodarone, they love asking about complications, corneal microdeposits, whether they're reversible or not, comes up. In yeah. practice questions, but not the best. Are, oh, they, they are yeah. if you stop. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. Just stopping treatment. A lot of the complications, if you still have the pulmonary, yeah, they yeah. But that's just another thing that comes up a lot, I've seen. Grand, do the last one. I've copped out this one. The following statements are true. Around. Got four again. Should we do it? So this is just to try and explore a few bits we didn't actually touch on. Some of them. Um, grand. Flaconide is a class one C antiarrhythmic. That is true. That's good. I'm glad that some of what I say actually works. <laughs> or you all knew it before. Either way. Esmolol belongs to the active of methanium. So what is this getting at? It is, yeah, absolutely. So, what, so this is to do with the metabolism of esmerol, which is by plasmarestrase. But much like remifentanil, it's these sort of non-specific plasmarestrases that aren't pseudocolinesterase that is involved in metabolism of such methanium, such as not the one that methanium. But this is to do, so the metabolism of esmerol is twofold, it's by um, plasmarestrases and by red blood cells. No, I won't confuse them with anything. It's just by esterases. Isn't it? Yeah, so that's what that's getting at. And that's why it's a short acting beta blocker that's used in infusions. Adenosine is metabolized by deamination. Yes, this is where the red cells come in. Adenosine is metabolized by twofold by deamination in plasma and by um, red blood cells. It's, so what's adenosine? Does anyone know? Purine. Yeah. Pure energy. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, and use it for. Um, Narrow complex tachycardia. Great, yeah. Absolutely. And they just stopped conduction for a long time. Great. That's good. Yeah, good. So it's a it's a sort of almost complete AV nodal blocker. It acts on specific adenosine receptor, but not on anywhere else in the body. It blocks all your conduction through the AV node almost, but it has due to its short half life, it's super for use in this setting and it gives you a little while to look at the underlying rhythm to see whether. You slow the rhythm or not, and if you slow the rhythm, then it must be super ventricular because it's going through the AVN. And if you haven't, it must be ventricular. You're not involved in the talk and block. Makes sense. And um, it's rapidly metabolized, which is why you can use it. Um, and it can't be used in asthmatics. One of the key things that comes up sometimes in the SBAs. Doses of six, six, and twelve cardiac monitoring large vein. Sorry, six, twelve, and twelve cardiac monitoring large vein, followed by big flash. Big flash. Grand. Hypokalemia is a feature of the toxicity. This is 
the other kind of the pattern thing that I wanted to really emphasize it's not hypokalemia exacerbated with and toxicity, it's hyperkalemia is the feature of it. Think sticking someone with the Jocks and Doctors kind of filter. You wouldn't do that for hypokalemia, you would do it for hyperkalemia. So, it's just ups and downs and comparison to the lovely stuff. And the Jocks is more protein bound than any other, and I'm glad no one thought that. That's good. <laughs> Brand, that's all I've got. Thanks so much. Okay. Cheers, everyone at home. I'll stop sharing and we'll end the meeting. Oh, there's a chat. Thank you. Uh, ET thought the same as you uh, about high protein binding, meaning that they can't cross membranes. A, I can't tell you with certainty, but I can tell you that there's a few high, high volume of the drugs that are highly protein bound. So mm -hmm. I would say it's not a rule you can rely on to infer from, mm -hmm. based on that. Um, that really would be the it's just quite hard to understand that, like theoretically, isn't it? Sorry, hyperglycemia. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sodium potassium ATPase. Yes, it would be bringing potassium into the cell against the concentrated gradient to make it go less. Uh, I think ET was trying to say something. Um, I can't hear it. Do you want to give it another go again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, just about. Okay. No, I just, yeah, I just I don't quite understand the, the the volume of distribution thing, and but like scientifically, because if a drug is attached to a like a large protein molecule, to me it doesn't make sense that it will have like be able to distribute very far through cell membranes. But yeah, I, like yeah, it's just I don't know how to get my head around that. No, it makes I sense. Can just, I can accept it as a fact, which you have to do with a lot of the primary stuff, I guess. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the things they talk about in um, factors that affect passage across cell membranes, isn't it? This protein. Yeah. Membrane. Uh, I think in that context, it is a rule, but I think in reality, it seems like it probably isn't. If I'm here, sure. the volume of distribution is 70 litres and it's 98% protein yeah. bound. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Thank you. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I shall just accept it as I do with much. <laughs> Unquestioningly. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks for another great session, Ed. <laughs> All right.